What's up, everyone, and welcome to the Long Game Podcast, hosted by Thomas Kopelman and Jacob Turner. In each episode, you'll hear us break down financial topics that are relevant to you and your situation. Our goal is to help bring credible financial information to you in short, bite-sized episodes. All opinions expressed on this show are for educational, informational, and entertainment purposes only. Nothing on the Long Game Podcast should be considered advice. Always consult with your team of professionals before making any decisions regarding your finances. All right, what is up and welcome back everyone to another episode of the Long Game Podcast. I'm your host, Thomas Kopelman with my co-host, Jacob Turner. And today we are with a special guest, Preston Holland. It's going to be a fun episode. We to- normally talk about like financial planning topics, tax planning, et cetera. And uh, one thing that has not come up, but has come up a couple times with clients for us is around you know, private jets. It's obviously like a really fun thing to think about of whether you can buy one and afford one, whether you have to use like a net jets or something like that, or whether you're like me and you're flying commercial and that's a, you know, a dream down the line. But um, Preston, we're really excited to have you on, man. Thanks for making the time to come and share all the knowledge you have. Yeah. Thanks guys for having me on. I'm uh, really honored and excited to uh, get to be on your podcast and uh, have a, have a fun chat about private jets. You know, it's a, it's a fun industry to be in. It's uh, you know, the trade shows definitely don't suck. Uh, so yeah, it's a, it's a good time. Yeah, man. Well, let's just kind of start off with a little intro of who you are, what you do and kind of why you're the perfect fit to have on for this episode. Yeah. So I am Preston Holland. I'm the chief commercial officer at Flying Finance. We are uh, an aircraft lending company. So we help people uh, find financing for their uh, private aviation purchases. So we finance anything as small as, you know, uh, single engine Cessna trainers and as large as, you know, 30 and $40 million business jets and everything in between. Um, Before I stepped into this role, I uh, headed up the, uh, private equity style roll-up of aviation media properties, inclusive of Flying Magazine, Plane and Pilot Magazine, AircraftForSale.com, AvBuyer.com, uh, which is a couple two-sided marketplaces and uh, you know 22 other aviation brands. Um, and then starting uh, in the fall, I, I stepped over and, and started running uh, our finance division and uh, we acquired a company in the space. And so I got tapped to kind of step over into that role. And and it's been a, you know, it's been a really good journey. I also uh, write a newsletter uh, once a week about private aviation. So uh, it's, uh, you know, coyly topiced. uh, I will teach you to fly private. Uh, You know, I I will teach you to be rich, right? It's a a little bit of play on words um, where we talk about jet cards and fractional purchases and whole aircraft purchases and, you know, what to look out for kind of tips and tricks from the inside of the industry. Because, uh, one thing about private aviation is is that there is a whole lot of mystery surrounding you know what it is that you, that you want to do right it, it, you'd be surprised right it's it, you know you're sometimes spending seven eight uh, figures of you know uh, of money on this and and you know a lot of people have no idea where to go and so I try and break down the barrier right I uh, try and expose any of the weirdness that goes on and, and a lot of, you know, the, the intentional opacity, right. Kind of breaking down some of those barriers and making it easier for people to step into the world of private aviation. So for really cool. me, Preston, I'm somebody that was really proud to be on Southwest a list this year. And that's my experience flying. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. And if you were somebody like me that has just stepped up to Southwest a list, and ultimately, at some point, you wanted to be a private jet owner. What does that transition typically look like for you, for the folks that you guys are working with in your business that are financing airplanes with you guys? Is it mostly entrepreneurs? Is it mostly corporations? Is it mostly individuals flying their families around? I'd love for you to share a little bit about kind of the demographic of folks you guys are working with today. Yeah. So it, when you, in terms of, of private aviation, right, it's a, it, it is a expensive activity. And a lot of times it's used for a, as a business tool where it really becomes, uh, you know, really useful is for people who live in tertiary markets, right? So, so, you know, say you live in, uh, you know, a, a hub, right? So if you're flying Southwest, you know, probably somewhere in Texas, right? Dallas, Austin, somewhere, somewhere like that. If you're flying Delta, you're flying out of Detroit or Atlanta. If you're flying American Dallas again, or Charlotte, um, 
you have commercial air service pretty much anywhere you want to go within a reasonable amount of time. For those that live in tertiary markets like myself, I live in Chattanooga, Tennessee, our direct air service is really limited, right? So if I wanted to go from Chattanooga to Bentonville, Arkansas, uh, which is a trip that I made about six times last year, it's about a 13 or 14 hour travel day. Mm. By the time you calculate getting to the airport, you have to lay over in Atlanta and then you have to fly into X and A because it's the closest commercial airport. And then you have to Uber 30 minutes to get into Bentonville. Um, you know, for people like that, especially if you're talking about using it as a business tool, right? Let's say you have a manufacturing plant or you're a distribution company and, and you're, you know, you have a trucking company. And a lot of times those are not found in places that has a lot of commercial air service. Private aviation could be used as a tool in order to get in and get out and be a lot more uh, productive with your time. And, and a lot, you know, there is an ROI calculation there. So, uh, you know, we'll see anybody from, you know, and, and, and again, it really depends on the buckets of, of which type of aircraft that you're trying to buy. So let's say, uh, let's say you're somebody who has, call it a $20 million revenue business, right? high margin, but it is it is high in-person touch. Maybe it's a machine shop or something like that. And you have locations scattered around the Southeast. Well, they may buy, you know, call it a $700,000 plane that may cost, you know, $1,000 an hour to operate. And they're actually able to see an ROI because they're able to fly their team around. Or maybe it's a, you know, last minute, uh, you know, you have a machine part that goes down and that machine being down may cost you $30,000 an hour, right? Well, now all of a sudden it, it's kind of a no brainer, right? Because I can go in, I can fly in an engineer, I can, you know, something like that. So that's, that's kind of called, you know, the, the entry level into using it as a business tool. And, and you guys have a disclaimer at the beginning of your podcast, and I really appreciate that. This is not tax advice. Please advise, uh, call your tax consultant. And if you have a question around aviation, uh, there are special aviation tax consultants uh, aviationtaxconsultant.com. The guy who owns that company is a good friend of mine. Please call him Daniel Chung. But here's a general statement. There is a tax benefit to actually using it for your business in the same way that when you fly commercially for business, that that is a expense line item. The same thing happens in private aviation. So, uh, you know, looking at it through that lens, right, becomes the calculation becomes a lot different than I am Preston, I live in Chattanooga. My family and I love to go to the beach and we are going to buy a private jet to go back and forth to the beach, right? There, that is a totally mm. different equation when you're thinking about it through that lens. And so, you know, uh, I'll give an example. We just closed on a deal for a uh, somebody in kind of the private wealth space. They are a pilot themselves. Uh, their business does, you know, between 15 and $20 million, but it is a service first business. So it is, you know, really high margin. Uh, they bought about an $800,000 airplane to fly themselves. They're going to use it 51% business use so that they can write it off on their taxes. Uh, you know, that's kind of the, you know, call it the get in. Uh, and then it, and then it, you know, kind of scales up from there, kind of depending on how big your business is. Yeah, Perspective is a powerful thing. Yeah. I think it's an interesting thing to think about. I think most people just view private jets as like the, I'm really wealthy and this is so I can go to my seventh house in Cabo whenever I want but there's actually a whole bunch of different use cases. And, I, and I'm curious, like, I think a lot of people just don't even know your options, right? So maybe you can walk through, like, after you say, I'm not going to do Southwest, what are the what are the different options you have? And maybe as you talk about them, you can kind of share who fits into that group. And, you know, maybe business is different, but like adding the business and then relative wealth levels of where people start to think about those. Yeah, so... Really, it breaks down into, you know, the way that I help people frame it is is there's really four options when you're thinking about private aviation. So kind of to start, start it off, just give you a full overview. You have on-demand charter, which is think of like an Uber. I'm going to call somebody or call an airplane and say, I want to go from point A to point B. And you pay them the money, you get off the plane, and then that's it. The relationship's over. Your second step is a membership program or a jet card is oftentimes what they're called. This is think wheels up or NetJets has an option for, uh, you know, kind of on-demand flying. There's Jetly. There is a soup du jour of membership options that you have out there. That means I'm going to fly probably more often than once, but I am flying less than call it a hundred hours per year. And so, you know, you, you measure everything in private aviation based off of hours flown. So if I'm going to fly from, you know, Dallas uh, to Atlanta, it's about an hour 45 
an hour and 45 minute flight, give or take, depending on weather. Um, so if I'm going to do that, you know, call it 25 times, uh, you know, that probably puts you into get a membership type tier, you know, on demand charter, kind of depending on what you're trying to optimize for. Your next step is a fractional ownership. This can be done a couple of different ways. There's programs like NetJets and AirShare, which are, you know, kind of structured, what they call floating fleet, which means that the fleet isn't ho housed anywhere per se. They kind of drift around the country in kind of designated areas. Um, the other option on fractional is you might find some friends that you want to share an airplane with. So let's say the three of us went in on a you know $3 million plane. We would each pay $1 million and we would get 33% access to that airplane, right? Give or take. And we would fly like we owned it. The, the last option is whole aircraft ownership. So I, I own the entire airplane myself. And then past that, you get into kind of corporate flight departments and, you know, uh, Home Depot or Walmart or Clayton Homes. Like these are all companies that have corporate flight departments that are flying executives all across the country at any given time. Um, so, you know, that's, that's kind of the, the you know, upper echelon of the, of the area. For private on-demand charter, um, that... It, I see people as, as you know W two earners, and it's a group of six or seven friends that are taking a hunting trip or a golf trip, and they say, "Hey, we're going to splurge, and each one of us is going to put up you know four or five grand, and we're going to fly you know a relatively short distance, and we're going to go play golf, and it's going to be a lot of fun, and it's going to be a memory that we talk about forever, right? Uh, and it's and it's you know it's probably just kind of top of the head, you know, after you cross two hundred fifty thousand or so in W2 income, kind of dependent on what your personal situation is, splurging once a year type thing, that's on-demand charter. It's going to be, you pick up the phone, you call a charter broker, or you call a local charter operator and you say, hey, I'm going, you know, two hours on this date, we're flexible with our time, uh, and you go, right? Uh, if you're if you're chartering out of your, your home airport, I'll, I'll give you a, a real life example. Um, if I wanted to fly today out of Chattanooga and I wanted to go to Miami, um, I can charter a PC-12, which is a single engine turboprop. Uh, it seats about eight people. Um, and I'm going to fly it for $2,000 an hour. Uh, that's the going rate if you call a local charter company. It's about, you know, here to Miami is about two and a half hour flight in a PC-12. Um, so five hours round trip, $2,000 an hour. It's going to be 10000 plus federal excise tax and probably some pilot fees on top of that, right? Um, you know, if you have to relocate the airplane back home, you're going to pay for every hour the airplane's in the air. Um, so, you know, worst case scenario, I fly down on the PC-12, it flies back, it comes and picks me up and then brings me home. I'm going to pay, you know, a cumulative 10 hours, $2,000 an hour. I'm going to pay $20,000 and $12.50 is the going day rate at our local charter operator. So my all-in price could be $12,500 to move nine people, eight people, uh, you can get up to nine. Uh, and golf bags and hunting gear and whatever for a round trip to Miami. Pretty cool, right? And and that's not, it's not inexpensive by any means, but it's also not so far out there that you, you know, may not splurge and everybody split a little bit and, you know, it, it may be two or three times first class. So when I think of private aviation, I think of one thing. I think that once you see it, you can't unsee it. So I had a friend of mine that had a golf stream and he took us on this golf stream and before I'd never flown private and then going to like the private terminal and just getting the whole experience of like, you just literally walk to the plane the minute you got there and there's somebody there and they, you know, serve you the entire time and you get off the plane, you just go. And I did it and I was like, okay, now I kind of get it. But obviously there's huge costs involved with this or there can be. And I'm curious from your perspective, as simple as you could break it down, there's obviously the cost of owning the plane, but what are the other major costs that somebody should be thinking about, especially for somebody that let's say they're somewhere between like the five and $25 million net worth range. You know, they're not looking to buy a $40 million plane, but it's something that they could potentially use in their business. They also potentially, maybe they are, or are not the pilot. What are the costs that they should be thinking about with private jet ownership? So when you own the airplane, there, there's a few fixed costs and these are fixed costs, whether or not you fly 300 hours a year, you fly 20 hours a year. It doesn't matter. You're going to end up paying this anyways. So your first is insurance, right? And insurance is going to vary widely based off of what type of airplane are you buying? Uh, what's the safety record of who's flying it and operating it? How many hours do they have? Is it professionally managed? Is it? Are you managing it yourself, right? So that's going to be anywhere from you know $15,000 a year to 
$40,000 a year and can even go up from there. And it's going to depend on hull value. Same with your car, right? Do you want to replace the hull if something happens? Do you, you know, is it just liability? You know, kind of what are you paying there on insurance? Um, second is hangar, right? And hangar space is really hard to come by. Um, and there's there's some some macroeconomic factors that go in there, but essentially the hangar operators have to write their investment to zero because of what's called a ground lease. Uh, it's mandated by the FAA. Basically, the county owns the ground beneath your hangar. And at the end of 20 years, they have the right to just get it and everything that you've done to it. So the building, the ground underneath, it all belongs to the county government. And it's part of the reason why nobody really invests in hangar space, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And it's part of a problem and, and it's, a, it's a macro problem and it's anywhere. You call your local airport and they're going to tell you the same thing. If you got hangar rent, it's going to be anywhere from, you know, $1,000 to $3,000 a month, kind of depending on, you know, what type of airplane, where are you hangering it? If you're in Teterboro, you're going to pay 10 times that amount probably, right? Uh, if you're in Chattanooga, you're going to not pay that much. Um, you have management fees. So that's going to range anywhere from, you know, $6,000 to $10,000 a month. And what that is, is it's your outsourced corporate flight department. It is the person who does the scheduling, the fueling make sure that all your maintenance is up to date. It makes sure that you have pilots lined up. It's going to make sure all of those, you know, call it fringe benefits that if you had 10 or 12 jets in a row, you'd have a full team in-house that does that. That's all outsourced. So that's, you know, jet management. Um, and then let's see. And then you've got, you know, cost of capital, right? So, you know, if you, if you finance the airplane, right, you're going to have those monthly payments every every month that comes due. Um, and there's, there's some some ways that you can optimize for that kind of depending on what your tax structure is and, and what your situation is using bonus depreciation. Uh, this year is 60%. You can take 60% in the first year of bonus depreciation. So it can kind of, you know, help, you know, parlay some of those financing costs and things like that. So those are the main yeah, things that go into it. Right. That's the big thing. You're not buying this in cash. You're financing it and taking the bonus depreciation, which. So, you know, it's, it's funny it, for us as a, as an aviation financier, we're actually competing against cash and the Federal Reserve more than we are competing per se against, you know, other banks and, and other financing options. The, the equation becomes, is my cost of capital or my risk-free rate of return, what is the delta between that and what I can borrow money at, right? So if you can go borrow standard, you know, what we tell people right now, today is January 8th, 2024 rates are coming down and we've already gotten our first rate reset at the beginning of last week. Um, but you're going to look anywhere between seven and a half percent and nine percent, uh, you know, interest. You're looking at 80 percent LTV and you're looking at between 15 and 20 year amortization terms. That is kind of the general what you can expect. Now, if you go older airplane, expect that LTV to be more like 60 to 75 percent. Um, and the amortization terms be a little bit tighter, but that's, that's kind of the general term. Um, so you're, people are asking themselves, okay, is my cash better used just paying for the jet in cash, or can I actually use that capital injected into my business? And will that have a better return? You know? And so it's funny, you know, 2023 was a really tough market for us, uh, in aviation finance because, you know, uh, and, and even in, and because we went from a ZERP environment where, well, I can't get anything on my cash, so I'm going to pay for the jet instead of paying four and a half, five percent interest. We went from that and we swung the opposite direction and we said, all right, well, my cost of capital is actually eight and a half percent now and my risk free rates five and a half percent on CDs. Right. And, you know, you can get risk free rate way above eight and a half percent. Right. So, OK, well you know, now all of a sudden my leverage equation becomes different. So it's funny, we actually compete against the balance sheet more than we compete against, you know, other financiers. Yeah. And it definitely make, it makes a difference in the business and how cash heavy they are too, right? A lot of businesses are, you know, it's a great tax savings tool, but it's also like a utility. And so, you know, the other opportunity cost is how can we use that money that we would be saving to grow the business too? Yeah, exactly. So it's, uh, but I think that, um, you know, those are back to your fixed cost question. Those those are the main costs that are going to come, whether or not you fly the plane or not. There is some ancillary fees like database updates and you know softwares and everything like that. But those are those are kind of your fixed cost. And then when you fly the airplane, uh, there's a few variables that go into. Again, remember we talked about earlier in private aviation, you're measuring everything based off of hours. So it's hours in the air 
how many, how much time are you taxiing, things like that. So into the ownership goes jet fuel, right? Averaging, you know, the, the US average right now is somewhere around $6.50 a gallon. Um, and your airplane burns so many gallons per hour, right? So we're, this is not a miles per hour conversation. It's a gallons per hour or miles per gallon. It's a gallons per hour. Um, you know, that can be anywhere from, you know, in small piston airplanes can, you know, burn 15, 18 gallons an hour to, you know, larger private jets can be burning 150, 200, 300 gallons an hour, uh, pretty easily. Dang. And so fuel, fuel is your big variable, right? Um, outside of fuel, you have planned maintenance. So you put away basically for every hour that you fly, you bank a little bit of money for maintenance. There's insurance programs that you can kind of buy into on an hourly basis. Um, and then you're actually putting money away towards engine, either upgrades, overhauls, future deferred maintenance. You're putting on a per hour basis into kind of a, a financial product called engine programs. So, so it sounds like you can't really get away with anything under like a quarter million dollars a year, just based on the hangar fee, based yeah. on the rest of the team. And that's almost like pre doing any trips. Then you have to add in the cost per hour of doing it. So this is something where like, I like one of my friend's dads, he has a split with people, right? Mm -hmm. He has like a group of other business owners. They do it. It works pretty well. I think the downside is like holidays, right? Like everybody kind of yep. wants to travel on the holidays the rest of the year. You're okay. So maybe you make that work, but the person who's going to own their own, like you're probably grossing, you're probably making over two and a half million dollars a year or super high net worth before you start to consider most of these, unless it's maybe a really tiny plane and you live in a smaller city and some of those costs are lower. Yeah. I think that, I, I think that that's, that's probably a, a fair assessment. And, and look, this is, this is not my realm. This is not, you know, telling people how they should spend their money or not is, is not sure. necessarily where my expertise is, but what we see kind of, um, on a, uh, kind of on a, on a regular occurrence. Yeah. I'd, I'd say that that's, that's accurate. Usually whole aircraft ownership is primarily reserved for somebody who owns some sort of a business, right? So it is, you know, uh, it is a tech entrepreneur who may own a cash flowing software company and they say, okay, you know, now it's time for me to, you know, buy a jet to be able to go visit clients. And again, that, that key is 51%, right? You have to hit 51% business ownership and then it becomes a lot more tax incentive for you. Um, and, and, and the equation becomes a lot different on that kind of financing question. Um, but like you said, right, aircraft co-ownership is great because that $250,000 a year is now split between three guys, right? And so now your monthly burn is, is a whole lot lower, but then it comes the Wednesday before Thanksgiving and that plane is flying a lot. It's probably going out and back and out and back and out and back. And that's if, you know, everybody coordinates their schedules correctly. Um, the, the best marriages that I see in co-ownership is one person who flies for business paired with one person who flies primarily for personal. So, you know, mm, let's say it's because you're flying personal, unless you really don't like your in-laws getting to Christmas or getting to Thanksgiving on Tuesday instead of Wednesday is not really a deal breaker. Right. Um, whereas the business owner, if I don't get there Monday, I might as well not go. Right. If it's that type of a situation. So having one person with a really flexible schedule and one person with kind of more, a timely schedule, right? So, hey, I need to be there at this time. Those are usually the best marriages that we see in, in partnerships. So you think about partnerships and I hear, I see a lot of things online about like, oh, well, you could potentially own your own jet, maybe with other partners, and then you could potentially, you know, rent it out or lease it out to other individuals that could use it and offset the cost of ownership. But in, re in all reality, even in the perfect marriage where maybe you have one person that's using it for business, one person that's using it for personal, and then maybe you are leasing it out on the times you're not using it. How do you see that working from a, and speak to as much as this as you want, the financing side and the, the money side of like, how much are they still ultimately spending on that plane in a given year? Yeah. So I, I wrote a, a newsletter um, and the, the headline was you can't house hack a jet uh, mm, because I had, I had a whole lot of guys who, I have a whole lot of guys who listen to a podcast uh, that will remain nameless, but they're basically said, I want to buy rehab, refinance and repeat uh, a private jet. And uh, I said, I, I have some really bad news. The for burr you. strategy, minute... but just for jets. Exactly. And I was like, I have some really bad news for you. This is a depreciating asset and 
the minute you step on that plane, a- any sort of cash flow that you thought that you had is get, you are going to eat that cash flow so quickly, like you're not even going to be able to see straight, right? Because if we're talking about if you own the airplane, and on that PC12 example that I gave, if I owned it and I'm flying it, I'm going to be spending somewhere around 450 to 600 dollars an hour as an owner, and that is just the fuel burning out of the exhaust pipe and the pilot sitting up front and and maintenance reserves for the engine rotating. And that's it. So if I was cash flowing $2,000 in that month on that jet and I got on it and I flew a two hour round trip, I just ate up all that profit, right? So you're not gonna cash flow the jet. Um, But what it does do is it offsets those fixed costs, right? So, um, and the way that, and it's trickle down economics is basically the way that it works on private aviation. Um, So, With that management company, if it's on a what's called a Part 135 certificate, which means that it is available for hire, think like a taxi cab medallion is like the equivalent, right? Yes, you can rent out your plane, and there is a there is a laundry list of requirements that the FAA has for those airplanes: safety checks, pilot checks, operating checks, things like that. So when you're flying Part 135 and you're and you're leasing it out. Um, you have to subtract fuel, you have to subtract that maintenance cost, all of those costs that happen per hour, whether you're flying in it or not, those costs still exist. Those get reduced from the hourly that you charge in the market. And then the operator does a rev share. That way they're in, incentivized in some way to get your airplane flying more often. The industry standard is anywhere from 90% to the owner, 10% to the operator, to 75% to the owner, 25% to the operator. And you kind of tug on those depending on the relationship with the operator. Um, but that ends up falling to your bottom line. What it does is it offsets your uh, those fixed costs that we talked about, those ones that you can't get away from. It helps lower those, but you're never going to be able to fly for free. It's funny. There's a lot of, a lot of my friends on Twitter and on Instagram, they'll send me these Instagram reels of these you know gurus uh, on social media being like, oh yeah, let me show you how I fly in my jet for free. Uh, and honestly, BS, I'm calling BS on every single video that I've seen up to this point because I know the airplane they're flying because I can look it up. And number two, I know how much it costs to fly that airplane. And the math says that the airplane has to fly a thousand hours a year for them to be able to fly free. And I will tell you this, there is not a private jet in the world that flies for a thousand hours in the year. Even the ones that net jets fly, they're flying 800 a year at best. Mm. Really interesting. I mean, so I think we walked through, but maybe like hit on a little, maybe we spend a little bit more time talking through like, you know, the, the tax benefits here. Cause I think we get, I think it makes sense, right? Like the average person, you gotta be making a lot of money to do this. At best, you're probably going to do a trip or so a year. And that is a reality, right? Like a lot of people actually could do that. So I think it's good for them to understand. Here's the hourly rate. Like if you do it with your family, it's going to be a lot more expensive than do it with your buddies. So there's a good excuse to go with your buddies instead of your family. And then you go to the next level, right? <laughs> don't, like don't, have- t- don't tell your spouse that, by the way. Uh, yeah. yeah. Don't let your spouse listen to this podcast because <laughs> if it's anything like my spouse, she'd say, no, you're taking me on the jet, not your buddies. She knows, exactly. she knows too much, Preston. Exactly. So we have that level. The next level is like, okay, the hybrid one. And that starts to make sense. I mean, doing the math, you could probably get in at 80,000 a year each, and then the the flight costs, which would be just on you. So that maybe is something people could start to do closer to, you know, a million to a million and a half of income, depending on where they live and taxes and cost of living. And then we have- And I think, I think too, it's the, the other thing to, to do in that calculation when, when you're thinking about you know, we, we, we had talked about business benefits, right? And again, if you are an individual and you're making a million and a half dollars a year and you want to own a jet, it, that is going to be a very straight line equation, right? Yeah. The other thing too is, is what you want to do is, um, and I'll, uh, if you subscribe to my newsletter, you'll see a lot of times I'll talk about effective rate per hour, which is essentially, uh, what you what you do is you take your fixed cost overhead, right? So you're talking about let's say eighty ninety thousand dollars a year, and I'm going to fly a hundred hours in that year. You take that ninety thousand divided by a hundred, so that's your fixed cost per hour, and then you add in the hours that you fly, and that makes your effective cost per hour. So you may be flying at thirty five hundred dollars an hour of variable cost, like on a Challenger three hundred, and then your fixed costs are going to be 
you know, you take your top line divided by the number of hours flow, and this could be another 2000 an hour. So now my effective hourly cost is $5,500 an hour. Um, that's, that's the way that you do that equation is, is you divide your fixed cost divided by the amount of hours that you fly. And that's why if you're flying under 150 hours a year, owning an entire airplane is far more expensive than just calling one off charters. Yeah. And this is still pre any tax benefits, right? So for right. a business owner, a lot of that being deductible and most of these people are going to be in the highest marginal tax brackets, it might cut a third of that cost potentially. Right. Yeah, exactly. And I think that, um, yeah, so you'd asked about tax benefits. Again, not tax advice, but anecdotal advice. Just educational uh, purposes. This is for educational purposes only. And if you call my lawyer, he's going to tell you the same thing. Um, when, when you're looking at uh, the act, so, you know, I'll give you a real example. Uh, so I had a, I had a newsletter follower, uh, a, a Twitter follower, X follower, and a newsletter subscriber buy a Challenger 300 uh, about a week and a half ago. Uh, he sent me a DM on, on Twitter and said, Hey, here's my budget. This is what I'm looking for. How can you help? And I was like, all right, well, uh, because I have contacts in the industry and because I know a lot of how this works, um, I was able to connect him with, you know, with a broker that was helping to able to help him identify an airplane, find it, negotiate the conversation and do the deduction. And I am talking and stalling right now because I'm going to pull up the actual numbers for you. Um, Perfect. So I, I broke it down. So the purchase price is $8.4 million. So he's well off. Was, yeah, he's well. So I even have, I even have uh, take home. I have, I have net income. I have uh, top line revenue. I, I, it, all with permission of the person who purchased this airplane to, to be clear. Um, the business does $77 million in revenue. They're in the supplements business. Okay. Um, they had a, uh, they had a tax liability, a, a tax obligation on $6.75 million worth of profit. income. So profit. So there's $6.75 million of profit. Uh, in purchasing the airplane at $8.4 million in 2023, they were able to depreciate 80% as a bonus depreciation mm -hmm. expense in the year. So they were able to take 80% of that in the first year, um, which represented a reduction of tax exposure they estimated of $1.84 million. So they put 2.9 down. They reduced their tax burden that they were going to have to write to the government at one point of 1.84. So now they're, you know, only actually do the government, you know, a million dollars as opposed yeah. to six, seven, five. That's how they were able to do the equation in their, for their business. They said, look, our, we're going to have to write it. This is, this is a direct quote from a text he sent me. We're going to have to write a check to somebody for $1.9 million. We can either do that. We can either write that to the government or we can write that to the owner of this airplane. I'd rather write it to the owner of the airplane and reduce our cost of private travel. They were estimating uh, if they were to fly the same amount of hours when it comes to uh, flying charter, they were estimating their, it, that their expense was going to be $3 million for the year. So they were able to reduce their hourly cost all in, right? So their their effective rate. We had, we had talked about this uh, a minute ago. They are all in, inclusive of debt service, so inclusive of their payments to the bank, um, at two point three million, two point three five million dollars uh, a year, based off of they're trying to fly, I believe, one hundred and fifty hours a year. So their effective rate is nine thousand four hundred and sixteen dollars per hour. As opposed to if they were chartering that, they were looking between twelve and fifteen thousand dollars per mm. hour, plus federal excise tax. Plus, they're not really sure if it's ever always going to be available for them when they're ready to go in two hours. So it's really interesting to think about all the planning that went into that decision for them, and and ultimately like how you guys helped them plan around potentially making a really educated decision, which I think is something that Thomas and I always preach to clients in our own businesses that the goal is to, that you guys are educated around the money, the finances, and then ultimately make really good decisions around it. And I love how you are able to break that down in their specific situation for folks out there that are listening to this and saying, well, that's great, but I don't make $77 million in my business or have, you know, net income of almost 7 million bucks to me. One of the things that we come across a lot specifically with professional athletes is they do want to do the one-off trip or maybe twice a year. They want to, you know, get a, get a jet and they want to charter it. 
But much of my experience in this world has been, it's the wild, wild west of what am I actually chartering? Who am I talking to? What kind of plane am I flying on? Because the reality is you are not flying on a commercial airliner anymore and you want to make sure that the, the maintenance is up to date. You want to make sure that the pilot that is flying you is capable of doing it. Where do you recommend that folks in that situation start to navigate that? Yeah, so I have, it's funny, I have a friend who flies a lot of golfers. He's a charter broker and, and he kind of has the golfer, the professional golfer niche. Um, if you guys watched uh, Perfect Swing, you saw a whole lot of net jets flying. Uh, whether you recognize it or not, I, being in the private aviation space, there's a dead giveaway. If it's a net jets flight, look at the tail number. It ends in NJ, dead giveaway that it's a net jets flight. Um, and the golfers that are signed with NetJets, they do get a discounted rate, uh, but that applies to like four or five golfers in the world, right? And, and everybody else who flies private, right? They're probably calling a charter to go fly somewhere and, and they're having some sort of a mix. Uh, there's a couple of ways to uh, mitigate some of your, uh, call it comfort level risk, as as well as uh, some of the safety risk, right? Because we number one priority, bar none, is safety, right? We want to get to our destination safely. And there are bad actors out there to be totally transparent. And if you go to the internet, uh, it can be a very dark place for private aviation because just because you're good at SEO optimization does not mean that you're a good charter broker or a good charter operator. Uh, those two things are not directly correlated. And so uh, one thing is find a really good charter broker. And what you're looking for is you're looking for one of two uh, certifications. You're looking for uh, what's called uh, the... Uh, ICAS, um, and what that stands for, I cannot remember off the top of my head, or you're looking for Argus, A-R-G-U-S. So there is uh, Argus Platinum, Gold, Silver, any sort of Argus rating basically means that that charter broker is only using Argus certified uh, operators. And this is kind of like lead or something like that, but there are certain regulations that have to happen to get that stamp of approval. And so that means there are certain maintenance checks. There are certain, uh, you know, uh, we don't fly into XYZ weather. We don't push the envelope on a wet runway or, you know, crosswinds or, or you know, a long list of, of you know, criteria. And so those are the things that you're looking for. Working with a trusted broker, um, is important. And that's why companies like Wheels Up and NetJets exist in this space is because it is the Wild West. You have no idea if the pilot's been drinking. You have no idea if the airplane, you know, actually needs a maintenance check and nobody said anything. There is 135 operational standards, but they are not always met and they are not always enforced. They are to the best of the FAA's ability, but they sometimes people are pushing the envelope or hiding the bag. And so working with one of those trusted names, if you work with a broker and all they use is Argus, you know, they may have a minimum threshold. Uh, so my friend who runs the charter brokerage, he has a very minimum threshold that you have to be Argus. I believe you have to be Argus gold, which is, which is perfectly safe. You know, you're good to go. They have a certain standard. They get audited quarterly to make sure that they are up to date and everything like that. Um, so, so working with those types of operators is really important because if you just call up Joe Schmo from Atlanta that happens to be who markets themselves as a charter broker, you and I, the three of us could start a char charter brokerage after this call and market ourselves as charter brokers. And we could take money and pay operators. And there is no regulation that stops us from doing that, which is crazy, right? It's, you're talking about millions of dollars and really high net worth people's lives at risk. Uh, who are flying private, but yet there is not a huge regulation. So those are the two big things that you're looking for uh, when you're calling a one-off trip. And the other piece, just as a, as kind of an aside on that, when you're talking about going with a charter broker versus you know calling up the local airplane at your shop, there's two advantages that you get with working with a broker. Yes, you are going to pay somewhere between three and eight percent above and beyond the price of the trip. It that is the that is the value that you're giving to the charter broker because they're going to help you out. If you have an AOG, which stands for aircraft on ground, and it can't fly, if you just called your local operator at your airport and their airplane can't fly, you are SOL, my friend. Like, good luck, right? Uh, you got to call somebody. With a charter broker, they're going to have to move heaven and earth. I've been to dinner with my friend, and he has been on the phone trying to recover a Honda jet out of, uh, out of Vegas, going from Vegas to LA. That was the trip that they were going. And he had an AOG issue and he had to relocate an airplane to get there. 
Um, that's, you know, that's a lot of the legwork and the service that they provide. Um, and they also are doing a lot of that vetting for you so that you can feel confident. Okay. I know I'm not going to get on a raggedy old airplane and it's going to be who knows X, Y, Z, you know, cowboy charter operator out there. Um, so, you know, there is definitely an elevated level of trust and transparency that comes with working with the charter broker. So that's kind of my plug for using those. Yeah. Seems worth the cost. I mean, flying is definitely not something you want to risk cutting costs on and, you know, with your life at stake, but Preston, man, this has been really awesome. I mean, thank you for sharing all this. This is something new to a lot of us. We've helped evaluate it with a couple clients, but haven't fully gotten to the point of like pulling trigger on it. So appreciate the time. Um, before we wrap up, let everybody know kind of best places to follow you, subscribe to your newsletter, all that stuff. Yeah. So the easiest place to find me is on X or twitter.com. Uh, it is Preston Holland and the number six at Preston Holland six. Uh, I tweet about private aviation and private jets and pretty pictures of planes. So uh, hopefully it's worth a good follow. You can send me a DM on there. I, I got my DMs open. So that's, that's probably the easiest way. Um, or you can go to our website, flyingfinance.com. Um, and uh, you can find links to my newsletter in all those locations and uh, sign up. I send it from my personal email so or from my work email. And so if, uh, if you get my newsletter, you can reply and it goes straight into my inbox. Well, there we go. Well, perfect, man. Again, we appreciate the time and sharing all the knowledge that you've accumulated over the years. And everybody, thanks again for listening. Please rate, subscribe, and we will see you back next week.